all you sumptuous salmon and slippery smolt. Welcome to Stories of Scotland podcast. I'm Jenny. And I'm Annie. And that wasn't a mistake. This week we're talking about the scaly and also silver salmon. We're going to be talking about both the natural and the not-so-natural mythological worlds of the salmon in salmon history. Yep, that's right. And I am going to be the salmon queen, I have decided. Um, So I'm hoping Netflix is going to pick up a series on me. If I can just really get some salmon on leads, maybe. You could pet a salmon at my zoo. They do bite, though. You've got to be careful. Okay, so Jenny, tell me (laughs) about the wonderful fish that has been a symbol of Scotland for as long as there has been symbols and people on this land. Ah, the mysterious and magnificent Scottish salmon. Scottish salmon are a bright, shimmering silver with hints of deep blue all along their backs. They are powerful beasts and have outstanding muscle tone and perfect markings, which all explains why they are known all over Scotland as the King of Fish. They weigh anywhere between 1.5 kilograms to as big as 20 kilograms. Wow, that's absolutely huge. Yep, that's just for reference, that's the same weight as your average four-year-old child. Or if you don't have a four-year-old child to hand, it's also the same weight as 16.6 male pheasants. I've read a lot of history books and I've never heard of the age-old Scottish measurement of a salmon's worth of pheasants. Things were much more simple before Imperial, Annie. (laughs) But the salmon spawn late in autumn and winter and this is a fantastic time to go fishing or visit some of our magnificent waterfalls throughout the country. My personal favourite is Rogie Falls, which isn't actually that far from Inverness. Here, a swinging bridge straddles a deep gorge right in front of these incredible falls, and you can stand and watch bird's eye as these powerful fish battle their way up the waterfall. Wow, that sounds absolutely beautiful. It is, and the word salmon comes from the Latin salir, which means to leap, and these fish, let me tell you, they can jump. And in some places where we've built dams or altered the salmon's natural path, you get salmon ladders. These are man-made steps up the side of a river, which water will flow down, and these will help the salmon to get up. And I remember seeing a salmon ladder at Pitlochry Power Station when I was a wee lass and watching the salmon climb the stairs with no legs. I've seen these, but I've never actually seen any salmon in action on them. Either way... Once the salmon climb their way to their breeding grounds, they do what all fish do and mate. Over a number of years, their eggs develop into fries, then par, and finally smolts, at which point they are finally ready to head downstream and into the big wide world of the ocean. The ocean is the oyster, you might say. (laughs) It really is. And they travel all over the North Atlantic and into the North Sea, where some of the best feeding grounds are. But... After a few years, they cannot deny the call of home. See, Atlantic salmon are anadromous, and this means that they migrate from the ocean back inland and up rivers to spawn. This is called the salmon run. But they do not return to any old river. They return to the very same river that they themselves were born in. Now, this can sometimes be a journey of thousands of miles, By the time they have swum all the way back to their forest gorge of their youth, they are in peak physical condition, perfect for finding a mate. Oh, I would swim 500 miles, and I would swim 500 more just to be that salmon that climbs that ladder to find another salmon who I adore. That was amazing. (laughs) (laughs) And that is a ye olde Scottish poem from 2020. (laughs) You're very welcome, Jenny. You're very welcome. And salmon aren't just romantic at heart. For a lot of people, they're also romantic on a plate with a wee (laughs) slice of lemon and some tatties. There's nothing like the Valentine's meal of a salmon that you yourself have caught for your your loved one. (laughs) (laughs) I, too, have been gifted many romantic salmon. Scottish salmon are renowned as the highest quality salmon that there is. Top chefs from across the globe seek it out specifically for its taste. And there is a reason for its great flavour. The cold waters of the Atlantic mean that the fish have a high fat content to keep themselves warm. And the strong currents and long distance migrations mean that they are very strong and have a lot of muscle. This combination means that the fish tastes wonderful. 
and it also means that they are a prize catch for many a fisherman. See, what I would love to catch is just one more exciting salmon fact. <laughs> okay, okay, one last one that I really enjoyed um, was that salmon season is really long in Scotland, so it runs from mid-January all the way to October. But each river has a different salmon run season. So in big rivers where there's always lots of water, the salmon come back home fairly regularly throughout the year. However, in smaller rivers and in the northwest, they tend to arrive only in the autumn as the autumn rains provide enough water for the rivers to be full enough for the salmon to make their way up. And somehow, the salmon know that they have to come back in autumn rather than, I don't know, June. Or maybe they've just been waiting at the ocean since June, like, oh, not enough water coming out yet. Somehow they know. Wow, Jenny. It's wild. You know so much about salmon. I know. I do, Annie. Thank you. I got into this one quite a lot. Salmon has been a symbol of Scotland for as long as Scotland has had symbols. When we visited Coast Sea Caves earlier for one of our first episodes, we saw some ancient Pictish carvings on the walls, and one of these was a slippery Scottish salmon. Yes, so we don't actually know what the salmon meant to the ancient people of Scotland, but it was obviously something very important, so important that they carved it into stone. And not just at Kaisi, salmon are found carved all over Scotland. By putting it on stone, the Picts preserved the salmon in time. However, sadly, the precise meaning of what the salmon meant for the Picts has been lost, slipped into the currents of time. Now, there are a few theories, some based on stories and myths passed down generation to generation, and others are just speculation. One of my personal favourite theories is that it could have been because the Pictish people themselves had come from across the North Atlantic Ocean as well and settled inland in Scotland. Their migration was the same as the salmon's, from Norway, where the salmon have their fertile breeding grounds, to inland Scotland, where they mated and settled and started a new life. It's possible that the Picts saw their own journey through the world reflected back at them in the annual migration of the salmon, and thus revered and respected them. That sounds like a very fishy tale to me, Jenny. I know, but I just, I just hope, I just hope they had that much insight <laughs> into this little fish. But we've got some strange sources from Romans, like Dio Cassius, mentioning that the Caledoni, so these are the Iron Age people who the Picts descended from that these people did not actually eat fish. And this totally shocked the Romans, as they knew Scotland had rivers absolutely bursting with fish. Ah, so they had so much respect for this beautiful creature that they didn't even eat it, despite the rivers being chock-a-block with them. <laughs> Amazing. Well, maybe. So I find this really interesting, because in many Pictish archaeological sites, large quantities of fish bones have been found. So archaeologists have done isotopic studies into Iron Age and Pictish remains, and we have two different stories. So isotopic studies essentially look at people's bones to tell you what they've eaten. And we see Iron Age bodies that are built on very high amounts of marine protein, of fish and sea mammals. Then there's also archaeological evidence that there was a period in Iron Age Scotland where some areas consumed very little fish at all. However, this completely changes in the medieval period, where fish become an absolutely major food source across the land again. So, in all honesty, I'm not sure what to make of Roman sources saying that the Caledoni didn't eat fish. Perhaps it was a way to present these people as savages, which the Romans absolutely loved doing. <laughs> it was their favourite game. And maybe the Romans did encounter some Caledoni who did not eat salmon because it was somehow seen as ancestral or sacred, which is also quite possible. I had no idea you were so interested in the isotopic Iron Age eating habits. Ah, well, there was a fascinating forensic archaeological study done, which discovered that Pictish monks at Port Mahomet didn't eat much fish at all. Okay. Which is very strange, as it's a coastal village with a lovely Pictish monastery. And then, in the medieval period, everyone began feasting on fish again. Huh. 
I like to think that it's because they held the salmon in some sort of special sacred ideology, but at the same time, it could have just been that the guy in charge didn't like fish and so didn't let anyone else eat fish. It can be an acquired taste. And they do stink out the house when you cook them. Yes, nothing like a boiled salmon to make the monastery smell foosty. <laughs> <laughs> What we do know from Celtic mythology is that the salmon was a very smart fish. Well, not quite, Jenny. What you're thinking about is the salmon of wisdom. It is one of the oldest creatures in Scots mythology, likely originating from Irish mythology, as there's the strong Celtic connection between Scotland, Ireland and salmon. Ah, yes, the Holy Trinity, the Scots, the Irish and the sacred salmon. May we eat in peace. (laughs) And the salmon of wisdom acquired its insight by eating precisely nine hazelnuts of wisdom that fell from the tree of knowledge into the well of intelligence. (laughs) In that order? Yes. (laughs) And the Celts believed that if they ate the flesh of a salmon, then they would gain the sacred knowledge of the other world via the protein of insight. (laughs) Did they dip it in the mayo of revelation while they did it? (laughs) Well, this is an interesting one because it ties in nicely with the salmon of bride. In a lot of the isles, when the first salmon of the season was caught, the fishermen of the settlements would have a huge big party. They would be celebrating the start of the fishing season as well as the fresh fish that would soon be gracing their families' tables, providing vital nourishment after the cold winter that has just passed. It was believed that if the fishermen were to follow the river that the first salmon was caught in up to its source, way up into the mountains, deep into the glens, that they would find the great hazel tree of knowledge growing over the genius source spring. The branches of this tree would be laden with red hazelnuts, each packed with the nutritious gifts of knowledge, philosophy, protein, poetry and art. These knowledgeable nuts would fall into the intellectual river and flow downstream. This is beautiful, Jenny, beautiful. Thank you. The first salmon caught was believed to have eaten nine of these knowledgeable little nuts, and the first person to taste the juice of the salmon as it was being cooked would be blessed with endless knowledge and even the ability to see into the future. See, Jenny, you eat a lot of Scottish salmon and you've never had one that lets you see the future. Or even that makes you particularly well informed. That is true, but I've only ever caught like the second and third salmon of the season, so... So Jenny, you seem to have been doing your research in the more normal areas of the library. Mm -hmm. However, I have dived deep into the archives to find some pretty surreal stories about the Salmon of Bride. Ooh, do tell me! Right, so we're returning to the legends of the infamous Kayak Beira. Ooh, we know her! We spoke of her in the Loch Ness episodes. She's the Celtic deity of winter, the environment, mountain building. She's the mother of the Gaelic mythology an old, powerful woman. She's incredibly strong, but also fierce and cold, and can be known as the Queen of Winter. She controls the worst storms and the worst blizzards. It is said that she washes her tartan plaid in the Gulf of Corryvreckan, her giant whirlpool and cauldron. And when her plaid is clean, it is white, and she lays it on the top of the mountains, and they are covered with the purest white plaid of snow. Exactly. But who we haven't spoken about is her counterbalance, Bride. Ah, so that's where the Salmon of Bride comes from. Yes, indeed. Bride is a beautiful and young woman, and there's many stories about how she interacts with Kayak Beera. Sometimes Bride is taken as a prisoner by Beera for all of winter. Now, Beera does this because she wants to keep her son Angus the Ever Young and Bride apart. Because they fell in love. Ah, classic helicopter mum move. Classic. She's not good enough for him. Or so she thinks. However, Bride shows Kayak Beera defiance by bringing her snowdrops. These are gorgeous tiny little white flowers that come out just on the cusp of winter finishing. And it's the signal that winter is coming to an end. 
Now this would be in January, which in Scottish Gaelic is the wolf month, because this is the month that wolves would come down from the mountains to hunt. Ah, that makes sense, because the full moon in January is known as the wolf's moon. Yes, oh. but also the temper of the wolf is very uncertain, just like the weather. Angus noticed that his sweetheart had been stolen, and he went on an epic quest to find her. He will be noticed. <laughs> <laughs> he realised... Three months in, he's like, oh, <laughs> I don't know where she gone. But he realised he needed better weather for this, so he cast a spell on all of the sea and all of the land. And he borrowed three days from August and put them into February. Ah, the old switcheroo. Uh, that does explain why the weather is so unpredictable here, with all the Gallic deities just switching all the days around, hither and thither. We had snow the other day in April. It's wild. That's why. You know what they say, don't trust a Gallic deity with your calendar. Or your scheduling. Very true. Yes. Yeah, you do not want one of them as a personal assistant. <laughs> now, Vaud was distraught. She was so exhausted and tired of winter, she hated being a prisoner, and she cried. Mm. She would cry, and her tears would fall, and wherever they hit the ground, spring flowers would grow. Aww. She began realising that she was more powerful than she knew. Yeah. So she used her sorrow to plant meadows and glens of flowers. Wherever Kayak Beira hid her, Bride would fill that place with flowers and life and springtime. And Angus was travelling all over the great bends and glens on his noble steed, searching for Bride. And he started noticing the young buds beginning to grow, and he followed them. He followed a trail of these new spring flowers, and that's how he found her. Eventually, they were reunited on the first day of February. And it was on this day of such joy and glory and celebration that it would forever be known as Bride's Day. Mm. And it coincides with the returning of the spring salmon. And salmon are so representational of all of the journeys of life and new beginnings. And so it's really fitting that traditionally salmon was eaten on Bride's Day. Ah, the 1st of February. That's Imblock, uh, one of the Gallic traditional festivals marking the coming of spring. So it all really ties into each other. Imblock literally means in the belly because sheep or female sheep ewes have their bellies growing with the spring lambs at this time. Yes, and in Ireland, it's St. Bridget's Day. So again, we're seeing this Celtic connection. Mm. But also, in Celtic mythology, certain animals are often connected with different elemental spirits and notions. Okay. They become representational of entire concepts and whole areas of nature. So the serpent and the salmon share a lot of narratives. So bearing in mind that the serpent and the salmon share a lot of similar stories. Can you guess what the serpent was connected with? Mm, I would usually say earth, but seeing as salmon are watery and they're connected, I'm going to go with water. Yes, yes. well done. Thank you. It is my witchy intuition. So on the day of Bride, it was also said that the serpent would come out from its winter abode. Mm, that's because snakes are exothermic and as soon as the ground starts warming up, they get Wrigley. Okay. But that doesn't usually happen until slightly later in the year. Mm. So I'm I'm not sure if we can trust the, the Celtic calendars on that one. Maybe that's because Angus, the ever young prince, had just taken the days and switched them all up and the snakes came out where they were made to come out because oh, it was all I his fault. I would be fault. so annoyed if I was a snake and Angus, the ever young, <laughs> had woken me up a month early. <laughs> I would be raging. It's like the worst <laughs> alarm clock in the world. <laughs> but we find this really strange old hymn about the Day of Bride and the Serpents. I've just got a verse of it here. I'm not going to lie to you, Jenny. I've not actually managed to make much sense of it. Here we go. Today is the Day of Bride. The serpent shall come from his hole. I will not torture the serpent, and the serpent will not torture me. Well, I hope it worked for them. Else, it sounds like that snake's getting fairly violent with them. Or not. They seem to have a kind of covenant, a pact, that they're not going to bother one another. Mm. So it's... I, I think it's more just like, don't be a nuisance to snakes, and snakes aren't going to be a nuisance to you. Ah, another one of these these sort of life lessons wrapped up in some strange old chant. Yes. I learn a lot from strange old chants. <laughs> that's how I taught myself to ride the unicycle, Annie. <laughs> no, that that's a very dangerous unicycle, and you know I disapprove of it. <laughs> anyway... The serpent was sometimes called Daughter of Ivor, 
and people in the MacIver clan were supposed to be safe from any attacks from snakes. They would just leave the MacIver clan alone. They wouldn't torture them at all. Mm. Also, a white serpent was believed to give special skills to physicians. If part of the serpent was cooked, the person who first tasted the juice of the serpent would gain power to cure all diseases. Oh, amazing. So it's kind of like the salmon with their knowledge juices are the same as the serpent and the, the, the medical juices. Cool. The serpent and the salmon are clearly great friends then, Annie. <laughs> they have so much in common. Just like us, Jenny. Ooh, what are you, the serpent of the salmon? I feel like you're the salmon of knowledge and I'm the serpent of um, hibernational sleep. I found a charming yet totally baffling quote from a book written in Cromwellian times. So it was written in 1658 and it's entitled Northern Memoirs Calculated for the Meridian of Scotland. And this book discusses the great quantities of salmon in Scotland to the point of excess. It states that The first runs here and washeth and melts the foundations of the city but gifts the country with her plenty of salmon. Where the masters are compelled to reinforce an ancient statute that commands all masters and others not to force or compel any servant or an apprentice to feed upon salmon more than thrice a week. Okay, so this book is telling us that Scotland has such a plentiful supply of salmon that masters want to ensure that their servants aren't eating it more than three times a week. Okay. But the writer queries why this is so, because it seems like such a strange rule. And the response is an absolutely tremendous piece of mid-17th century logic. And the reason of it is, as I conceive, from the plenty of salmon in these northern parts, that should the inhabitants daily feed upon them, they would inevitably endanger their health, if not their lives, by gorging. For the abundance of salmon hereabouts in these parts is hardly to be credited. So the danger, in my opinion, lies most in the diet. For as salmon is a fish very apt to make people overindulge, more especially fresh salmon when only boiled, which if too frequently fed on, relaxes the belly and makes the passages so slippery that the retentive faculties become debilitated. So suffers the body to be hurried into a flux and sometimes into a fever as pernicious as death, which is much better prevented by abstinence than to stand the test of uncorrected physic. So the writer believes that people who eat too much salmon in their diet would have a very unhealthy digestive system. You could call it that. To the point of potential death. Jeez. Hence why anyone who had a servant had to ensure that servants ate a more varied diet than simply salmon. Now, I've not found any evidence that this statute actually existed in law, so it was perhaps just a 17th century rural legend. However, it's really persevered <laughs> as a rural legend, and whenever any historian writes on the history of Scottish salmon, this quote always bounces up as evidence of the overfloweth of salmon within the rivers. The old 17th century cleanse. It's a whole different type of salmon run, Annie. Oh, Jenny, that's <laughs> dreadful. <laughs> so can we finish on a wee poem about the Day of Bride? Yes, we can. I found this in a book called Wonder Tales from Myth and Legend by Donald Alexander Mackenzie, published in 1917. So, Jenny, can you be a Celtic poet? When softly blew the south wind o'er the sea, lisping of springtime hope and summer pride, and the rough rain of Beera ceased to be, Angus, the ever young, the beautitious god of love, the golden haired. The blue, mysterious eyed shone like the star of morning high among the stars that shrank afraid when dawn proclaimed the triumph that he shared with bride the peerless maid. 
Then winds of violet sweetness rose and sighed. No conquest is compared to love's transcendent joys that never fade. What a lovely poem about the day of bride. A day to feast upon salmon. And the salmon is representative of growth and enduring cycles, of seasons changing and journeys throughout the seas. And it is a fish for celebration, a fish whose travels throughout life remind us that there are rewards for perseverance. Absolutely. And I think the ancient Scots, they knew that. The salmon is a symbol of Scotland and it has travelled through time and mythology to land right here in our podcast. Their adaptability and strength have been revered for centuries and the wisdom brought by the salmon is truly a treasure of Scotland. Thank you so much for listening to Stories of Scotland. It's been a pleasure. It really has. And thank you to everyone who's got in touch recently to let us know how much you're enjoying the podcast. It means so much to us. And if you feel like it, give us a little rate and review wherever you listen to your podcasts. And tune in to the next episode, which is going to be about castles, ghosts, and clan wars. Oh, I cannot wait. Slangeva. Slangeva.